A warm welcome to today's talk, Saturday the 3rd of December. Now there's kind of a joke in healthcare because we have a procedure called an ERCP which stands for an, uh, endoscopic retrograde coleopancreatography. Um, but sometimes people say ERCP to mean emergency retrospective clerking of patient. Now not that anyone would ever change early records from a patient's admission because that would be unethical. But it's an interesting joke anyway. Uh, on a separate matter, the chief scientific officer and the, uh, the the chief medical officer have gone really quiet lately for the last for the last month or two. We've wondered where the heck they were, and it turns out they've been beavering away on this huge report that details the uh, the history really of the pandemic. Very well written, very comprehensive, and we're going to be looking at a couple of aspects of that, and we'll look at what it doesn't say as well as what it does say to some extent. Now, just on a separate matter before we start, we did notice that the deaths were nine people died in the week in Africa from COVID, we noticed from the, um, from the report that we looked at yesterday or the day before. Peter, hi from South Africa. Uh, granted, we of course are now heading into our summer season, but for many months now, COVID has been relegated to the pages of history. No restrictions, no masks, no vaccines, boosters, etc. Nothing going on, it's over. Life is back to normal, except of course for the abominable economic backlash caused by COVID lo lockdowns and tanks rolling across Europe. So pretty profound comments there from Peter, and I've had several comments from South Africa indicating that is the case. So looking good news in Africa as a whole, including South Africa. Now let's get on to the content of today's talk. Um, technical report on COVID pandemic in the UK. Now, it's incredible. It's a really, it's like a PhD thesis. This is incredible. Uh, chapter one, understanding the pathogen, which I'm going to look at a little bit today. I'm not going to, I'll just tell you what the other ones are. You can click on them, you can download them um, freely. Um, they are very well written. Disparities, research, situational awareness, all these are big chapters. Modeling, testing, contact tracing and isolation, non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, uh, educational settings, NPIs in educational settings, care homes, pharmaceutical interventions, therapeutics and vaccinations. Uh, improvements in care of COVID-19, communications appendix, I'm not going to go out, that, that, they're the main chapters. Uh, but very detailed and technically written it is, and it's all the chief medical officers and scientific officers from the, the home countries in the United Kingdom. So it's good that they're getting their perspective down, although it must have cost quite a lot of money to produce because these people are on very high salaries. And of course, the people that are paying for it are uh, us humble taxpayers in the UK. But it's there now. It's a historical document. Um, and it, it is interesting reading, um, albeit somewhat frustrating. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Now, coincidentally, uh, the Baroness Hallett Independent Public Inquiry is coming up now. Uh, the COVID-19 inquiry. This is sort of on a bit of a rolling start at the moment. I think the first deputations will be taken early next spring. Um, but um, it's almost as if certain people wanted to get their point of view in <laughs> quick before the, uh, before the public inquiry. Let's hope the public inquiry is not in any way influenced by this. And uh, we believe it won't be. Although we have believed quite a few things that have turned out to be disappointing. This is the public inquiry here. It's got this very poignant picture of the old person's hand and the young person, the child's hand on either side of the glass. Now, th th these family tragedies have affected many of us when my own father was in his um, terminal stages of his uh, re recent uh, re de de death, death um, 18 months ago, uh, about just over a year ago. But for four or five months in hospital, I couldn't visit him. Um, and it was just a terrible situation. And, and many of you have been riven by such family tragedies. Was all this justified? Um, you get the impression that this report is trying to indicate that it did. That's the technical report. We're hoping that this in independent inquiry is going to be uh, representative of public opinion and suffering. Now, it is. There's a, a share your experience uh, link is there. Click it. You can go straight to it. And you can tell the public inquiry about all sorts of things. Now, I stress again, this is not the technical report that's written by the scientific officers and the medical officers. This is the public inquiry now, which is completely, we hope, a completely different, uh, different thing. So you can write up about everyday life, um, families, including relationships, um, official information, um, 
losing someone because of COVID-19. All sorts of categories that you can speak to there. And the data will be uh, anonymised. We're, we're sure that the data will be anonymised, unless you want to put your name down, of course. So I think that's a very, uh, very encouraging development that that transparency will be will be there. Quite what's done with that massive information that's going to ensue, though, of course, and, and it will be a complete massive information. There'll be a huge amount of information comes out of that. Quite how they're going to qualitatively and quantitative, qualitatively and quantitatively and analyse that is going to be a huge job. Anyway, just one chapter from getting back to the technical report now. Chapter one, section six. What was the duration of natural acquired immunity and vaccine acquired immunity and the risk of infection over time? Now, this is what the report does. Just This is just to give an example. Basically, it is a historical view of what happened throughout the pandemic, uh, the way thought thinking developed and the way that policies developed throughout the pandemic. That's largely what it is. It seems to be an account of what the scientific and medical uh, establishment not the scientific and medical personnel in the country, but that these leaders were uh, thinking over time or what the impression they, they would now like to give us over time. And of course, technically, it is, it is a highly accurate uh, document. But for example, by early, this is the way they do it. By early 2020, data emerged indicating that majority of individuals infected with sars coronavirus 2 displayed an antibody response between 10 to 14 days after symptoms. Not at all surprising, but that was clear by early 2020. Throughout the first half of 2021, following natural infection, antibodies detected in saliva for at least eight months and in blood for at least nine months. And remember, this is still early 2021. Uh, the presence of antibodies associated with the protective effect against infection at least 7 to 12 months, cell-mediated immunity, which is the long-term immunity response to sars coronavirus 2 was shown to be detectable up to eight months after infection. And of course, we now it's, know it's much longer than that. So that's kind of what the inquiry does. It's look, it looks at all these different topics and looks like a historical perspective of them. Really, it's a bit of a history of the pandemic through the lenses of the uh, chief scientific and medical officers. Um, I'm not sure that this information that we've just looked at on natural immunity percolated through to much in the way of policy, uh, but nevertheless, we give that purely uh, as uh, an example uh, for the way that the document develops. And, and then they do these reflections. Th th basically, what they're saying is this is what future chief scientific officers and medical officers need to learn. And this is their conclusions from chapter one. Scientific and medical advice will uh, need to be formulated on the basis of limited data. Yeah, of course, there was limited data. We accept that. Understanding the pathogen and the disease was a global effort, particularly at the onset, and sharing of data and expertise from the beginning was key. Uh, that's what they're saying there. But of course, this didn't happen very much, did it? Um, certainly in the early stage of the pandemic, that was sadly lacking. Uh, po uh, point three, gaining a clear understanding of the pathogen and disease require an array of cross-disciplinary studies. Well, that's pretty obvious, I would have thought. Point two, building, uh, building on and adapting existing research systems and networks was usually much faster than setting up new ones. Yeah, sure. Uh, but strong leadership direction and coordination are required. Again, fairly obvious. And the last point from this chapter a viral variants, population behaviours and population immunity change significantly over time. So if that's the conclusion of chapter one, it's not overly impressive. It's, it's some fairly obvious things going on there. Didn't really mention um, state uh, secrecy needs to be eliminated uh, early. Opening up sharing of, of all available science, particularly thinking about the early cover up in China. Uh, so no more cover-ups at governmental levels. That would could be included. It wasn't. These are just my suggestions. And please do feel free to suggest better ones. This is just me sort of quickly thinking out loud. Dangerous gain-of-function research should stop. Procurement should be on the basis of clinical and scientific need, not commercial interests. Powerful and international cooperation, uh, corporations should not be allowed to influence the agenda. All pharmaceuticals should be considered rather than just expensive ones, although, to be fair, uh, they did use steroids, which are very cheap, so don't want to be too cynical about this. Um, pow pow powerful international corporations and individuals should not be allowed to control public communications. 
early scientific peer review must be allowed and encouraged based on full disclosure of primary data. We're still waiting for primary data from quite a few clinical trials that could be mentioned. These should be public because in this world, there is some really clever scientists, statisticians, mathematicians, doctors. Let everyone get hold of this data so they can analyze this data um, on our behalves. I might not have the expertise, but, but we, know, we know people that have. Give, put this data, primary data, anonymized into the public domain would be good. Early scientific peer review must be allowed and encouraged based on full disclosure of primary detail. Primary anonymized data from clinical trials must be made uh, public for the world's clever people to uh, access, particularly the doctors, statisticians and scientists, data scientists. Scientists and doctors with outlying views should be judged on the quality of the evidence they present. Play the ball, not the man or the woman. And then they do go on to talk about the legacy of the pandemic, that uh, there is excess deaths now, and sadly they think this is going to continue for some time, uh, basically uh, including uh, heart disease and cancers, although other conditions as well as a legacy of the pandemic, limited uh, ability to access care, people's reluctant to access care, perhaps even some uh, post-COVID sequelae and, and other factors could be influencing uh, morbidity and mortality for some time into the future. And it raises the tragic spectra that not only will we be paying for this pandemic economically for decades, probably for a century into the future, um, but there could be excess deaths for a long time period of time, um, which is pretty sad to think about. That, that could include me, it, it, could include, it could include you. I hope and pray that it doesn't. But that's the current situation that we are in. So very interesting report, do feel to download it. And, and if you live in the UK, do feel to give comment to the, the Baroness Hallett uh, public uh, inquiry. I think that's all I'll say for now. We'll leave it there and um, thank you for watching.